loving ourselves doesn't always mean loving the good parts. It's loving the good, bad, and the ugly and being okay with that. And that took me a while to figure out too, because I always loved the best parts of me, but I was the worst critic when it came to the worst parts of me. So those are some of the common themes that I had. Welcome to Discover More Podcast. Sheena, welcome to the show. What does fear mean to you? And why is it important to work through whatever fear that may be? Yeah, I mean, when I did my first YouTube video, that was before any of this happened, like the podcast, the speaking. I was just brand new in this world of like digital marketing. And I knew I had to put myself on video because video was a great way to put myself out there. And yeah, it was nerve wracking, right? I'd had butterflies in my stomach. It took me two hours to record a two minute video. I would stutter. I would have sweaty palms. And of course, the this fear, right? It's basically, you know, the fear is kind of like protecting us from making mistakes, right? Especially when we're children, something happened to us traumatically and then our brain subconsciously protects us from it. So, you know, my brain was at the time trying to protect me from something like you don't want to get made fun of, you don't want to fail. And failure was a big thing for me because I tell most people that I failed kindergarten when I was five for coloring outside the lines, right? So my brain was protecting me from failure, right? Not knowing that failure is a good thing. And so when it comes to fear, right, I always tell people we all go through fears and to be fearless is not having fears. It's to have fears and to push through them anyway. So for me, I had to push through them because if not, then I wouldn't be here today sharing that story. And it's important for us to push through it because that's how we can build confidence. We can go out there and make moves. We can go out there and make things happen and have the courage to forge our own path to be the person that we're meant to be. Yeah, it reminds me of Eleanor Roosevelt's quote, everything on the other side of fear is everything you desire. Of course, it's very cliche, but I think when you work through your fear, however that fear manifests in your life, I think uh, a lot of opportunities and magic happens and I'll wait on the other side. Uh, I want to go deeper on the train of fear, Sheena, because fear manifests differently in your life throughout. So how has fear changed for you and how has your approach to fear evolved over time? I mean, I still have fears for sure. Don't get me wrong. It's not like I'm confident every single day, right? I go through different challenges, different environments. I mean, the pandemic alone was a huge like slap in the face, right? It kind of felt like the world was over. There was nothing to live for. And I was ready to just sit in my room, watch K-dramas all day and <laughs> not do anything <laughs> because I was afraid to go out there into the unknown. And especially in our culture, we've been trained to always have security and stability and to fear the unknown. So for me, I had to realize, you know, I didn't have to do this myself, right? I can go out there and ask for help. And I'm glad I was able to have the support to help me pick myself back up, right? Uh, regardless if I was scared or not, I wasn't the only one going through this. There was a support system out there who was cheering me on. And so of course, I still go through imposter syndrome, right? If someone, you know, invites me to speak, I'm like, who am I to go out there and speak, right? And then at the same time, I have to like tell myself, you got this, you deserve this. You've been working so hard to get to where you are today. You just give your best speech ever and there's someone out there who can relate. And every time I do that, the people love it, right? Do I get nervous? All the time, right? And nerves is a good thing, right? It just shows us that we just wanna do the best job that we can. Sometimes fear is just an indicator that we just wouldn't really give a good job. We just wanna know that what we're doing out there can really impact somebody. And so sometimes fear is just testing us, right? To see how strong we are, if we can push through them, right? If we can go out there and make moves. I say, you know, if you can think of the worst thing that could happen and you're okay with it, then go ahead and do that, right? Like, let's say you wanted to reach out to a company to for a speaking engagement, right? You just reach out to them, right? What's the worst that could happen? They either ghost you or say no. Are you gonna live through that? Probably, so should you do it? Yeah, right, why not? I mean, I always say if you don't ask, the answer is no, right? And you'd be surprised how many people say yes when you just go out there and just ask, right? It's a crazy thing. <laughs> it's, it's simple, but scary. I get it because we're so afraid of the outcome. But when we learn, we can learn to detach from the outcome and just go out there and do our best, um, you know, then we just keep moving forward and just keep making moves, just keep creating the things that we want, creating better representation, empowering our community. It's not always easy, right? I know it's not always easy. I've been there. I know it's tough. Sometimes the hardest step is the first step. 
But, you know, once we take that first step, it just imagine what we can do. And also as women too, right? We have a huge confidence gap over men, maybe because of how we're raised, right? We, you know, from as young as six, little girls already have confidence issues while boys don't, right? I had a friend who was telling me, you know, guys, you know, they don't have any fear or they don't care about rejection because when they go out there and just ask for a girl's number, they get rejected so many times to the point they're like, they just keep moving until they get, you know, a girl's number, right? It's a numbers game. So when they go out there and do things, it's just for them, it's a numbers game. It doesn't matter if they get rejected or not. They're happier that they went out there and did it. Versus women, you know, we second guess everything, we over prepare, but something still holds us back because of the way we perceive ourselves, right? We feel like we're not good enough. Who are we to go out there and make that presentation or ask for the sale or ask for that promotion? And so all these things that we go through really stops us from making that first step, right? Or imposter syndrome. And that's why there's less women in leadership and high position roles, less women entrepreneurs making money because there's a huge confidence issue. But imagine if women just went out there and took action and just, you know, figured it out along the way, we would succeed so much better. I mean, there was even a test that I was reading about this uh, psychologist who decided to do a test between boys and girls, and it was just to solve this problem on the computer, right? When they had the results, he noticed that the boys did better than the girls, but he realized that the girls didn't even try, right? They didn't even put an answer because they probably thought they were going to get it wrong. So he went back to the group of women or girls, and he said, your only task is to try and solve it. Just try and solve it. It doesn't matter if you get it right or wrong, just try and solve it. And so when each and every girl in that group decided to solve that problem, guess what? The girls did better than the boys. This is what I mean. Like, you know, if we just go out there, take action, figure things out the long way, course correct along the way, we can make moves, right? Sometimes we have to do everything wrong to get everything right, to get the clarity, to get that aha moment, to push forward with whatever it is we want to do in life. Yeah, it's not necessarily spray and pray, but at least if you throw darts at the map, it's going to land somewhere. But if you don't throw, there's no mark. Nothing happens. Yeah. yeah. I want to highlight something, a theme and a threading line from what your story, Sheena, is that fear is almost like a marker. Anytime fear manifests in your life, in whatever domains of your life, whether it's professions, asking for networking, as you said, or asking for speaking engagements by just cold calling or reaching out. Anytime that fear shows up emotionally, it's a good reminder saying, oh, this is where I fear scared, or this is where I feel this internal butterfly. Oh, this is an area of growth. There's opportunity within that butterfly. So I think I want to highlight that because it's a good cue because not everyone has this heightened self-awareness, but I think having this very concrete thing to remember, you're like, okay, Sheena and Benoit talked about anytime I feel scared, that's actually where the opportunity lies. And there are limitations and circumstances. but. With that, I want to zoom in a little bit closer. You talked about in passing that a lot of times it's a numbers game. There's going to be a lot of no's, but some yeses. Do you have any things that recall from recent times or some of the more remarkable days where you're like, oh, they will never say yes. What's the point? But you say, you know what? I'm going to do is scared and something magical happened. Oh my God, I have way too many stories. This interview might go on for a while. I mean, even as simple as reaching out to women to be a guest on my show, I mean, people don't realize like, yeah, I've interviewed over 800 women, but imagine how many women I had to reach out to. Imagine how many women didn't say yes or ghosted me, or I had to follow up for four years just for them to say yes. So yeah, it is a huge numbers game, right? Um, even when it comes to having your own business and even going out there and just, you know, reaching out to women, right? People who don't know you, but they see what you do and they, they love what you do. I mean, it's still the same thing. I still got rejected. Some of them didn't answer me back. But of course, you know, there's times where I do feel like, oh my God, I'm such a loser. Nobody said yes to me. And that's okay, right? We have to feel how we feel. And then once we can do that, you know, we can pick ourselves back up and move forward again. Sometimes no could be a good thing, right? It could be a blessing in disguise. No can mean not right now. If we just change the way we see the word no, it just makes it a lot better, right? And no can just be another opportunity, right? So I, I don't want people thinking no is the end of the world. To be honest, I would rather if someone said no than to someone than like getting like wishy-washy answers, right? Because at least they're direct, they know, and I don't have to bother them anymore, right? So sometimes no can be a good thing. And then there was also this quote, like 99 out of 100 times you'll get rejected, but that 1% that said yes could impact the world, like 90% of the world. And a great example of that is the light bulb, right? Uh, Thomas Edison got 10,000 no's before he got a yes, and literally everyone has a light bulb. So imagine if he stopped at his you know 10th time, 100th time, 1,000th time, or even his 9,999th time, 
what would the world look like right now? today. So, and there's a lot of women or not women, just people in general who go through so much failure, who go through so much rejection is that we're so blinded by people's achievements that we don't understand the story behind it, right? They see all the glory but don't hear the story. And this is why sharing stories is so important, right? Of women of how they're able to forge their own path, overcome obstacles and thrive because we want people to realize like it's not easy sometimes, it sucks. You might want to ugly cry a couple times. You might have to work 24 hours straight in a day. Um but, you know, all that is worth it when you see like the light at the end of the tunnel. And I think the more we're honest about this, you know, the more people can appreciate us and realize, you know, they can also relate to us like if she can do it, then I can do it, right? I have no special powers or anything. It's just really me going out there and making things happen. And yeah, there's days where I still resist because I still get scared. I still go through imposter syndrome. I still feel like I'm not enough. And so I always have to work on myself as well, right? Sometimes I do things like I say three things to myself, right? To kind of just get out of that self-doubt and pity party. And it's like I tell myself, I am loved, I am enough and I am worthy. And you know, I keep telling myself that until I feel better. And yes, sometimes when you do these things, it might feel weird or awkward, and that's okay because these are things you've never done before, right? Like with fear, it's just an indicator like you need to grow out of your comfort zone, right? You need to step out side so you can go to the other side of the hill or the mountain, whatever it may look like, so you can grow and be the person that you're meant to be. And if people saw fear that way, you know, they would take so much more action in their lives, right? I always say actions speak louder than words. And so when people see you making moves, you know, they'll be like, "Who are you? What are you doing?" Like confidence doesn't always mean that you have to be the loudest person in the room. It's just, you know, you're just out there making making things happen. You're out there knowing that you are capable enough to turn your dreams into a reality. I want to highlight something that you said in terms of the benefits and the power of affirmations. So this is clinically speaking in science, if you put brains under a MRI scan or a CAT scan, it actually shows a shrinking of amygdala and a brain activity shifts based on the level of affirmations. So scientific benefits of affirmations have been proven. And of course what you alluded to is a self-affirming practice, right? Through gratitude or saying that I'm loved. And there's a lot of power in that because I want listeners to be aware that anytime I have someone on that's high level, high caliber on the show, whatever answers and stories we share, yes, they are real and they're valid and there's truth in that. It's our truth. But emotions are transient. Just because right now Sheena is feeling 10 out of 10 and all confident and amazing, right? As you said, no pity parties. Tomorrow or six hours later, she might hit a dip because life is cyclical. It's a season. And I don't want people to say, oh, they're always confident if I do this X, Y, and Z, I'm always going to be confident 24-7. It's like, no, you will be confident, but sometimes you won't. And I think we have to recognize the seasonality of that so that, okay, we don't always have to be feeling perfect every single day. Yeah, I love that. And I think that's so important too, especially in our culture, because perfection is something we all strive for, but you know, it doesn't, it's not real, right? There's no such thing as perfection. And when we can learn to show up as our imperfect selves, I mean, we can just make more moves out there. Uh, I know it's easier said than done. And that's why it takes a lot of work on ourselves, right? Or we don't have to do it ourselves. We can seek help to help us get out of that because we all have blind spots, right? And that's why sometimes having a third, a second eye or a third eye can help us see our blind spots and realize, you know, this is what's, what's stopping you. There's something in your childhood that's you know, resisting you from making that move or think, you know, just different examples. So I love that you mentioned, you know, the word perfection, because I mean, that's something that is still that we still deal with till today. Yeah. What I always say is, unless your last name is Christ, and first name is Jesus, <laughs> you're not perfect, right? Um, yeah. But yeah, it, perfection is honest, a thief, and it, it robs away from what we're truly capable of. I want to talk about the opportunity cost, or the art of saying yes, versus art of saying no. As you alluded to, Sheena, sometimes you have to do the outreach, you have to follow through, you have to work through and move through the fear and this butterfly you feel. At the same time, life and time and resource and energies are finite. So how do you approach what to say no to and what to say yes to? Because like Steve Jobs and a lot of the greats, they attribute their success not about the amount of yeses they said, but actually to the amount of no's so they can actually double down and refine whatever they're passionate about. Yeah, I think it's also me learning to work with my intuition a lot more, right? Um, which is something we don't normally do or something we're not taught to do. And I mean, I've like shut down my intuition so many times and I realize that every time I shut it down, 
it was just a hot mess. And so now it's learning to say yes with feeling, right? Like if you have this like feeling inside that you know you have to do it, just go out there and do it, right? And we have to understand sometimes how we picture it in our head might not, will probably look the total opposite of what will happen, but that's okay, right? And we have to be okay with that because when you look back, you'll be like, I understand why things had to happen the way they happen. And so for me, it's more like, does it feel good? Does it make an impact? Is this something that I want to do? And, you know, if, if if it does, then I say yes. If it doesn't excite me, then I'll say no, right? I'm okay to say no because I know where I'm going. I know where I'm heading and I'm learning to, you know, trust myself more versus like all the noises in my head. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about trusting yourself and self-confidence because confidence is self-trust. So the best definition I've heard about confidence is you believe in your ability to deliver what you said you would. What's your thoughts on that? definition and what is your definition of confidence or self-confidence? My definition is similar to that. You know, it's knowing your capabilities to go out there to make things happen. And I think that's something that women aren't doing, right? A lot of women feel like they're not capable. They're not good enough. They're not worthy. And so if you don't believe in yourself, you're not going to go out there and take action, right? Everything has a foundation and it all starts with our mindset, knowing that we are capable of doing it. Even if we suck at first, we know eventually we'll get better at it, right? Like podcasting or video or selling or marketing, like anything we do in the beginning is going to suck, especially if we have no clue what we're doing, right? And sometimes we have to embrace the suck to the point that the more we do it, we're like, well, we don't suck as less anymore and this is getting better, right? And then you slowly build confidence. Like for me, I don't think you should build, like confidence shouldn't be built by taking a leap of faith. You can do that if you like, if that works for you, but I believe the big results are based on the small daily actionable steps that we do. So like, let's say you wanna write a book, right? And you're like, oh my God, I need to write a 200 page book. How am I gonna do that? Just write one page at a time, right? Just write one page a day, and by the time 200 days passes, you have a whole book or you can turn it into two books, right? But taking that small, actionable daily steps is what I believe will yield the big results when it comes to building confidence and trusting yourself because those little steps really help you build it up, right? Like one thing I remember doing was like trying to figure out how to do a virtual background on Zoom. And for the longest time, I was like, I don't get why mine isn't working, right? Like the virtual background was on my shirt instead of the actual background. And you know, for the longest time, I was like frustrated to the point I finally got it. And I was so happy because like, finally, I figured it out. I feel so confident. What can I conquer next? Yeah, I never figure out the virtual background Zoom. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I, I just, uh, I was like, oh, I looked it up. Yeah, it's some sort of a changing of the settings. But I resonate with what you said in terms of big things are comprised of the small things over time. Dr. Jordan B. Peterson, he has a quote. He's a clinical psychologist that I respect on a clinical level. And he talks about life is comprised of what repeats. So get those repeated things right. Because I think a lot of times you forget the power of momentum and the power of compounding. Because whether it's a good habit or a bad habit, air quote, they compound over time naturally. That's what that means, right? Like if you don't make your bed after six months or three months, your room is a mess. But if you do make your bed, you have a sacredness of order in your room or in your bedroom. So I just want to highlight that because that's what you're alluding to. So you talked about cultivating a network that keeps you grounded, because I think whether it's mental health or physical health or emotional health, I think grounding takes a village. For those individuals, it's very helpful because you can't always ground yourself by yourself, as you alluded to, because we have blinders on. That's literally what biases means. You don't know what you don't know, period. Do you have any feedback or thoughts about how to cultivate this network of trusting confidants who can truly ground you? Because like we said, grounding really takes more than one effort. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I mean, it looks different for everybody, of course, right? Everyone has their own way of getting support or seeking support. And sometimes we're afraid to ask for professional help, right? Especially because, you know, in society is still seen as like a bad thing when really it isn't. But, you know, you have to do what works for you. Maybe, you know, you can start small by listening to a podcast or reading a book or you can talk to your best friend, right? Everyone has a friend that they can, you know, talk about anything and everything, the good, bad, and the ugly. And sometimes that could be just enough, right? And as you keep working on yourself and figuring out what you want to do, you can move on to the next level. And then maybe join a women's group or hire a coach or hire a mental health professional, whatever works for you. Because what may work for me might not work for you because we're two totally different people. That's why it's so important to go out there and figure out the things that you would like to do or that would help you. Yeah. Isn't it interesting that a lot of people in society 
they would follow or subscribe to a air quote blueprints by a certain guru they put on a pedestal. And then they're like, wait, this doesn't work. Well, obviously it doesn't work. This was someone else's journey, not yours. So how can we ever expect someone else's way will work for our way? It's, it's, it's funny. So let's talk about your podcast, Sheena. The, you are definitely an OG in this space, seven years deep. Congratulations. I'm about half of your lifespan so far. Hopefully uh, I will make it to year seven uh, down the road as well. Whether it's fear, whether it's confidence, whether it's scaling up our impact, I'm sure as you understand as a professional podcaster, you witness some reoccurring themes over and over again. For me, it's a lot of mental health themes, a lot of spiritual themes for esoteric. It's a very vast question. What are some of the most prevalent and important themes you have seen over and over again in your podcast by interviewing over 800 amazing, prolific Asian woman leaders? Yeah, I mean, one of the most common themes was just, you know, how they perceive themselves when they didn't do the work, right? Not feeling good enough, always people pleasing, feeling like they can't make their own decisions, not being able to use their own intuition. And that's things that we never talk about in our culture, right? That's something that is, you know, we're told to just put in the back, never say anything, and we just keep the traumas to ourselves. But, you know, when we talk about what we went through, it's actually part of our healing process because then we realize, you know, we do have a problem and we need to find a solution, right? So when these women realized that they were going through something, they like had this aha moment and realized things had to change, right? And so they sought help. They started doing the work on themselves, whether it's, you know, going to a self-development event or, you know, listening to a podcast or working with a professional, it really helped them take it to the next level. And so I realized that, you know, we all go through something and, you know, we have to work on ourselves to go out there and make it happen. Or we don't have to, you know, or we can ask for help, right? Everyone's journey was totally different, but there was like common themes. And one of the things that they also said was self-help was, or like, self-care was very important, right? Because we're always told to always take care of others and we forget the most important person in the world to take care of, which is ourself. And, you know, this is something that's not taught in schools. Nobody tells us to like, you know, here are eight self-care rituals that you can do, right? It's more like, here's your math project, here's your science project, here's your history project. I believe these things need to be taught in school as young as, you know, kindergarten, as as soon as they start school, right? Mindset, self-care, confidence, because These are the real life skills that they need when they go out into the world. And especially during the pandemic, everyone was burnt out, right? Working from home. And it's not like working from home. You're working from home. You're taking care of your kids. You're homeschooling them. You're taking care of your family members. You're running errands. You're running chores. You're cooking, cleaning. Who wouldn't get burnt out, right? Like we forget to just even spend five minutes to ourselves, right? And so this is why self-care is also very important and being okay to also show up as our authentic self. Self, right? Loving ourselves doesn't always mean loving the good parts. It's loving the good, bad, and the ugly and being okay with that. And that took me a while to figure out too, because I always loved the best parts of me, but I was the worst critic when it came to the worst parts of me. <laughs> so those are some of the common themes that I had. Yeah, I got some goosebumps because loving yourself and self-love or self-worth isn't only valuing the best parts. It's the good, bad, and the ugly, as you alluded to, Sheena. Because I feel like when we ourselves are incapable of in, like embracing all parts, including the ugly and the bad of us, how can we ever expect our partners, our spouses, our parents, our friends, our colleagues to embrace the uglier sides of us? That doesn't really make sense. Like if we don't embrace it, they're not going to embrace it either. So that's very, very intricate. And I want to put that on the messaging board. A lot of things we're saying here is simple, but it's not easy. It's tremendous yeah. hard work, but it is simple because you just got to make a decision and start working on yourself. So I think actions or ability to act is predicated on self-awareness. So how has self-awareness been a theme throughout your guests? Would you say that the more successful in terms of who are willing to do the work or willing to work through the difficult things, that's how I view success. Would you say the more successful guests on your show are the people with higher level of cultivated self-awareness? Yeah, I mean, you know, they realize some of them have reached like a boiling point and realized things have got to change, right? Whether it's they're going through cancer or domestic abuse or bankruptcy, they knew things had to change, right? They knew, you know, they went through something that is stopping them from taking to the next level. And so a lot of us have traumas in our life, right? That stop us from taking action. And we're not aware of those traumas. And that's why sometimes it's important to seek help 
so that they can unlock the traumas we have. Not only do we have our own traumas, we have inter intergenerational trauma, trauma from our parents, grandparents, ancestors, and it can go as back as four generations. And if we're not aware of what our family has gone through, then we can't move forward as well, right? And I know it's not always easy because our parents, grandparents, you know, they never want to share anything bad that happened to them, right? I mean, there's things that my grandma will take to her grave, right? Because, you know, she'll never tell us. And so we have to learn to unlock those things too, right? You know, whether it's to seek professional help or an expert to kind of unlock that, we go out there and seek that because it helps us in the end, right? Sometimes, especially when it comes to money, right? Like money is a huge, a huge thing that most people go through, right? There's a lot of uh, trauma is a lot of perceptions, right? Money is evil. Money is the root of all evil. Like how it's like, is it really the root of all evil? Like, you know, money can help build schools for the less fortunate. Money can help feed the poor. So how is that evil, right? It's just learning to switch that perception and learning that maybe, you know, our parents, grandparents, ancestors went through a horrific part of their lives that they never talked about and have always seen money in that way. And it's been passed on to us. As a Asian Korean American myself, I resonate with the level of self siloness that our parents and grandparents exhibit because, hey, they don't want to burden other people, right? That's their mindset. It's like, no, I went through it. It's just my experience to bear. I don't want to burden my kids, whatever. I share that because about a year ago, my mom went through a very extreme case of emptiness syndrome. This is my second time sharing on the podcast where she actually was missing for 36 hours. We filed a police report. I was coming back from a vacation in Cancun. My, me and my sister and my dad, we, all, we honestly thought my mom died. It was that extreme. We couldn't find her. And of course, the police was useless. They say they cannot do anything until 48 hours. But the survival rate cuts half every hour passes. And then, of course, my mom came back healthy on the 36 hour mark. What happened was she drove herself to a hotel because me and my sister were leaving East Coast to the West Coast. So she felt like at age 59 or 60, she felt like her entirety of her life was poor for us. But now they're all leaving the nest, so to speak. So she had the extreme difficult emotional volatility and she actually blacked out. And I don't want to share more gory details because that's not the place. But what I want to share is after this missing incident, we were able to have the deepest mother-son conversation as a human being. And I share a lot of things I never shared with her, and she shared a lot of things she never shared with me ever. Because A, for me, I realized it's not guaranteed. Our parents could pass away any moment. Nothing is guaranteed. And for her, she realized that she needs to share her trauma and her suffering with her son, who's an adult and also a clinician. Because as you said, expression is the opposite of depression, a famous mental health adage. Whatever you don't express gets depressed. So I just want to share that because I really think there's a lot of, sometimes in life requires some earth shattering moments, but then it's going to bring us closer if you're willing to engage in that space. So for you, Sheena, it's a heavy hitter question. What are some of your catalysts in your life that are the boiling point that forced you to come out of your cocoon to become this butterfly to finally do the things you want? despite or in spite of the cultural containers or suppression that, that that's there? Yeah, I mean, one of them was when my aunt passed away 11 years ago. Um, she passed away from a horrific accident. You know, she didn't even reach 60 at the time, but she was able to do things in her 50s that most people didn't do in their 20s and 30s, right? She went to travel, she went scuba diving, rock climbing, all these things. And of course, coming from an Asian background, right? When you see, you know, a 50-something-year-old woman doing all those things, you have all these relatives saying, what are you doing? You're too old. Something bad's going to happen to you. But, you know, it never stopped her from living her life, right? Like what happened, you know, her kids went to college, they became adults. And, you know, a lot of moms go through this where they feel like, who are they after their kids, right? Um, they're trying to find purpose or trying to find something to do, or they feel like they're not a whole person anymore because they have no one to take care of. This happens more often than we realize. And not just Asian moms, just all moms in general, right? But she realized, you know what? Now she has this time to go out there and, you know, see the world, travel, do things that she wanted to do. And so I realized that after her death, like anything can happen in an instant, right? Like I could die this very minute. 
well, I don't want to die at this very minute and realize I didn't do anything, right? I just went to work Monday to Friday. Not saying that it was bad, but if that's not what you were meant to do, you know, you're going to feel some, some way, right? And that's like the catalyst that made me realize I need to live life differently. I need to start living life on my terms. And I don't know what that looks like. Is it scary? Yeah, definitely, right? But if I don't do this, I'm going to regret a lot of things, right? That was one of it. The pandemic was another one. Like I mentioned, I thought it was the end of the world, right? And if uh, my family, you know, didn't like kind of have an intervention on me, just saying, you know, like, you know, we're all going through something, right? We're all going through something. We need to, you know, go out there and not even go out there. It's just like, we need to like be there for each other, right? If you're going through something, don't bottle it up inside. Tell us what's wrong with you, right? And being able, like you mentioned, being able to share the things that we go through was actually healing. We understood each other a lot more, right? And also being able to trust the universe, whatever opportunities that came my way. Like I met a lady online, you know, who started a book series and, you know, I just said yes. I didn't know what I was saying yes to, but I said yes, but it's been a great journey ever since, right? I mean, at that point I was like, we're stuck at home. There's nothing else to do. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? But it's been such a great blessing because, you know, I've found a tribe of these amazing women who are also, you know, bossing up in their lives. I have, you know, someone to talk to when things are tough or, you know, like we all go through some form of growing pains in our life, right? And then, you know, it's just opened my eyes to different things that I never thought was possible. And also being able to create an impact in the world, right? To elevate women, especially marginalize women, because, you know, we're still going through that till this day, right? The representation of women in leadership for women of color is very small till this day. And so that's why it's so important to create representation for underrepresented groups to show them that it's possible. And one thing that we're missing is like more women mentors. There's not a lot of women mentors out there. Most of the time when we have a mentor, it's a man. Most of the time, a Caucasian man, right? So that's why we need more women mentors so we can break the cycles that we're going through, especially at a time where women's rights have been taken. I know today's Independence Day, but it doesn't really feel like celebrating freedom when we can't even choose our own bodies. <laughs> it's really important for women to put yourselves out there, right? Because that's how we started this interview. Because as you said, without action, there is no reaction. And a lot of times, whether it's good or bad, it requires some things to be done. So like for you, Sheena, especially you talked about women's rights being suppressed now more than ever. To lighten up the, the space a little bit, I want to share a study. It's done by Harvard Business Review, uh, done a few years ago. The time is a little bit loose because of COVID, but I think it's a few years ago. It actually examines the top woman leaders in Fortune 500 companies, which is pretty small representations, versus male leadership. It actually turns out that woman leadership in Fortune 500 had higher retention rate, higher productivity, higher happiness, healthier and more robust culture, X, Y, and Z. And of course, we live in a very patriarchal, paternalistic society, but Mayan culture was a maternal society. And as we know, it's one of the most successful cultures ever existed before the aliens wiped that out or whatever the cause of extinction was. But I feel like having these stories, including yourself or looking up the Harvard Business Review, which I strongly encourage all the listeners to do, discover more about that after the interview, you will see that there's a lot of validity to what Sheena is saying. And that leadership isn't confined to male or female or gender per se, but we do need more representations. On that note, Sheena, why do you think representation is needed more now than ever, especially in 2022? I mean, just like the Roe versus Wade overturn was really like a slap on the face. It set us back a couple of generations. So we need our voices to be heard more that, now than ever. Even when on that day when Roe versus Wade got overturned, like I even saw an article on the Austin Chronicle. I was a sponsored article promoting Asian male order brides. And that to me just like set it off. I was like, this is 2022 and Asian women are still seen as objects that they can order off catalog, Right. And so, you know, I posted it on social media. I reached out to people of higher influence to get the message across. And it did, right? It did get the message across. You know, the media platform took it down, had an apology. I got interviewed by different media platforms. And then, you know, even media platforms outside of the US were reporting on it. So this is why it's so important for our voices to be heard. We need to call out the injustices that's happening. Is it scary? Yeah, of course it's scary. Like, it's not like I really want to speak up about it. Like, I do. But at the same time, like, I don't know what could happen, right? But I also don't think about that, right? I'm just like, this needs to be taken down because 
this is uncalled for, this is unacceptable. Even if you were to read that article, it was basically a manual on how to land Asian male order bride, you know, telling you the top five countries, what their profile is like, and, you know, just using this like derogatory language. It's just like, this is 2022, this should not be on it, right? And the fact that was a sponsored post was even worse because someone is paying them to promote it. And they're not the only media platforms out there that's doing that. There's a couple ones out there too that are doing the same thing. Some of them have already taken down, some of them still have it up. But the fact that it's still happening in 2022 from like these reliable media sources is really, you know, a huge slap in our faces, right? We're here trying to create better representation and be seen as not quiet, submissive and obedient. And then we have this article that basically says, you know, we make great wives because we just do as we're told, right? And that shouldn't be the case. People don't understand the traumas women go through when it comes to becoming a male order bride, right? Whether you're Asian or not, it happens to every culture. Uh, they get prostituted out. They become their sex slaves. There's a lot of mental and physical abuse. And that's not what we want, right? And people don't understand that, you know, these people that have these businesses, you know, paint this perfect picture for them, like saying, oh, you know, you're going to live the American dream. You finally have a husband who will love you. And when they're in that situation, it's like, not the situation that they thought it would be. It's the total opposite. So, you know, this is very harmful, not only for Asian women, but women in general, right? Being seen as a sex object. It's not like you hear articles about mail order husbands. <laughs> uh, I've never seen one, right? Imagine if it, if it was, you know, the other way around. How would you feel as a man being used as like a object out of catalog that they could just buy off? Of? I'm sure you wouldn't be happy with that either, right? And it was funny how so many people was trying to justify because it was a sponsored ad that it was okay. It's like, no, it's not because we have to live by integrity. There's a set of ethics and code of standards that we have to live by to make sure that, you know, what you're reporting is, you know, is safe as well. And it's not harming people. It was crazy that, you know, I was able to help just get this out there, you know, just reach out to the people. I didn't know what was going to happen. I was literally just mad and I just need to share this and realize, you know, this is not right. This is, this is uncalled for. This is unacceptable, especially on a day where women's rights were taken. Like we need to call it out. We need to call it out because if no one does, like nothing will ever happen. Yeah. It's like sprinkling salt on the deepest cuts of wounds, right? Yeah. For more context, can you contextualize the article a bit more and talk about what is a mail order bride for people who've never heard about this, who are not familiar with the concept whatsoever? Yeah, I mean, you know, mail order bride is basically a website, you know, that the, you can pick a bride off of there and basically pay for it, right? Uh, you can bring them from different countries to the States. I'm not really sure what the whole process is, but that's basically it, right? It's not a dating site. It's like you're there to find a bride. Right. And of course, you know, some of them they've never met in person. Some of them is just they choose in, they just bring them in. That's my understanding of it too. So, <laughs> yeah. But the really important thing is, Sheena talked about it earlier, but a lot of these individuals and women who are coming from Philippines or Vietnam or some of these more developing countries, they are A, they don't have the literacy, B, they don't speak the language of English. C, they don't have the education level to vet through the potential whoever's paying for this mail order bride. And they are lured here because it is luring under the disguise of American Dream, as Sheena talked about. Because American Dream is a very celebrated, this glamorized thing in the world. Americans don't realize how privileged and how deep privileged Americans have. So a lot of these folks, a woman, will seek out these opportunities to help out their family, their parents, to move out of the slums in a lot of these places they live in. And it's not a fair competition, air quote, because people here, they have the money, they have the resources, they know the tactics, while the women, they're on the receiving side who are not equipped with information or power or resources. So uh, thank you for sharing that. It's very important. On that note, I want to create some space for advocacy, Sheena. What are some of the things that you think our listeners or even myself uh, should be more aware of at this time, because I know you're very deep into the communal space and advocacy work. I mean, for me, it's always just creating better representation, right? Especially for our community. You know, we go through the model minority myth. Asian women are also seen as quiet, submissive, and obedient. And so because of that, we do get into situations like being an Asian male order bride or human trafficking or different things, right? Even with the shooting in Atlanta, right? It's like the victims were being blamed because they were sex workers. It gave the guy an excuse to shoot them. Like that should not be an excuse, first of all. So we need to dismantle these negative stereotypes we go through. Even Asian men, right? They're always not seen as the sexiest, you know, men in different cultures, right? And so learning to create better representation and dismantling the negative stereotypes 
will be taken more seriously, especially when it comes to high position roles and leadership roles, because that's one thing we are very lacking in, right? There was a report from Catalyst.org when it talked about the representation of women of color in management roles in the U.S. in 2021. So, of course, Caucasian women had over 30 percent. Uh, black women had 4.4 percent. Hispanic women had 4.3. And then Asian women only had 27 that's very low, right? And this is based on last year's numbers. So for me, like the topic of women leadership is very important because I want Asian women to be seen as the leader that they're meant to be, that they are worthy enough to go out there and make things happen and be okay to make mistakes, be okay to show up as your imperfect self, because these are the ways we can create the change that we want to turn the stories around, to dismantle these stereotypes and to show our current and future generations uh, that anything is possible out there. Yeah, I want to drive this message at home. So I want to share some statistics you shared with your recent interview last year with Stanford University's Global Educator Network. You shared in the pandemic, international women lost about $800 billion in income. Do you have any other numbers that you think that you can't come up on the spot? Because $800 billion of income loss just for women demographics compared to men, that is a staggeringly high number. It's crazy. I mean, the pandemic really affected us, you know, in the States in the month of December 2020, there was a hundred percent job loss for women, a hundred percent. And a lot of them had to quit to homeschool their kids because there was no one else out there to take care of their kids. Even here in Canada, women lost their jobs a hun- like a hundred times or 10,000 times more than men. I mean, it's just crazy that, you know, we were going through so many different things. And even when women are having more businesses out there, only uh, like 10% make like six figures and more, right? 90% of them don't. When it comes to asking for a bank loan, we still get a smaller amount than men. So there's so many things that we still go through. And that's why it's important to, you know, talk about these things to have gender equality, right? I mean, there was a report saying that gender parity won't be achieved until like 130 years from now. No one wants to wait 130 years for that. I know the postmodern feminist has two different meanings now. One is like anti-men, one is just for the empowerment of women and for the equity. I'm a feminist in the definition that I believe in equity and equality, of course, because like I have a younger sister. I grew up with a single mother. I love my grandmother. I love my mom. I love the woman in my life. And all men out there, they all have females or women in their life. Yet I don't understand how you can be viscerally against gender equal gap uh, like gender pay or equal pay or gender equality when your mother or your siblings or sisters or spouse are women i never understood this dichotomy or this chasm between why is gender equal pay such a controversial topic now that doesn't really make sense to me so in that sense let's go back to your podcast a little bit and tie this threads together like if you were to curate a list of qualifiers for the best leadership qualities or the best confidence qualities that you saw on your podcast or in your own life, you know, what qualifiers would be on that list they curate? I mean, making the first move, right? That's one thing. If you want things to happen, go out there and make the first move. Be okay to ask questions because you never know who might say yes. So like when I used to work at an office job, I remember getting um, a salary review, right, from my boss. And he was like, okay, it was 50 and now I'm going to give you 54,000. And so I was like, are you okay if you can add another thousand because Anything that ends in a foreign Chinese culture is a bad <laughs> is a bad omen. And this is a real story. It's a bad omen, right? If you say number four in Chinese, it also means death. And he did the same thing. He laughed at me. He's like, are you serious? I was like, yeah, I'm serious. And of course, he thought it was funny. He thought it was a joke. But in the end, he gave it to me. So it's not that I got an extra thousand dollars. It's the fact that I asked for it and I got it is the biggest lesson. So you just don't know what happens when you go out there and just ask, right? That's what I like. You know, I'm, I'm a big like advocate for asking. Like I'll ask anyone anything, right? If I'm traveling, if I need someone to take a photo of me, I'll ask them. If I get lost, I'll ask for directions, right? If I think something is damaged, I'll ask for a discount, whatever it is, right? Like whatever it is, like don't be afraid to ask. Will you get a no? Yeah, of course. I mean, that's normal, right? But you'd be a su- surprise who says yes. Also embracing your fears, right? That is huge. And I know it, takes a lot of us to embrace our fears. That's why it's important to have support. You don't have to do things alone. You can do it as a group. When I was able to overcome my fear of video is because I saw other people who were in the same position as me, who were just scared, who also had to do their video like for two hours to do a two minute video because like 
they under I understood that I was they were going through the same feelings as I was going. And if they can do it, then so can I, right? So learning to embrace your fears, showing up as your imperfect self, learning to make mistakes, being okay with taking action and figuring things out along the way. Have I made mistakes in my own journey? Of course, I've made more mistakes than I could think of, but it's also led me to opportunities that I never thought was possible. I always say your greatest mistakes could be your greatest opportunities, right? And learning to be kind to ourselves, you know, being our biggest advocate and cheerleader, that is so important, right? If you want things, if you want to attract the things that you want, it really has to start with ourselves. You know, you want people to cheer you on, start with yourself. You want people to connect with, like you want people to, you know, like advocate for you, advocate for yourself, right? When they can see your passion, your conviction, they will come to you, right? I mean, when I reach out to people, I don't tell them who I am and what I do and how awesome I am or whatever it is. Uh, You know, I just tell them what my purpose is. I start with my purpose. I lead with my purpose and they, they get it and they love it. And they, you know, end up saying, hey, we would like to do a speaking uh, engagement with you. Hey, we'd like to collaborate with you. Hey, we'd like to sponsor your event, right? Because it all leads with purpose. So that's another thing too, leading with purpose. (laughs) Yeah, I uh, want to share a small anecdote in terms of the power of asking is this was last year when I was in the cusp of renewing my auto insurance because car insurance is very expensive in America. It was something around $3,500 for the entire year. Oh, wow. And I don't really drive that much because I don't like driving. So I said, hey, I'm not going to pay over $3,000 on my insurance for a year. That's unacceptable to me. And I said, would you pay $3,000? And he's like, I mean, I wouldn't, but X, Y, and Z. So I said, hey, can I speak with a retention officer? So this is also a tip for everyone who want to update or change their insurance or save some money. Every national insurance has a retentions office. Retentions office are the office that can rewrite and restructure your premium and your actual lease or the auto insurance. So I got transferred. And within 10 minutes of speaking to the retention officer, I saved $1,500. My total insurance went from $3,500 to like $1,900. I said, can I make it sub $2,000, please? And I got it. So if I never asked for that thing, in 10 minutes, I saved $1,500 US dollars in 10 minutes. It literally comes down to saying that, can I speak with a retention officer? So that's another message to echo what Sheena said, right? Of course, I speak, I'm, a, I'm fluent in Mandarin. That's why I laughed because S is, it means death. And eight, fa, 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 fa means like up, up, up. And number eight is the most expensive uh, license plate in China. And a lot of floors, number eight is like the most expensive floor. But all that to say that never underestimate the power of asking because you just don't know what you don't know. So I want to take a soft pivot into the business side, you know. And so tying everything we're talking about in terms of asking, in terms of putting yourself out there, in terms of working through the difficult emotions in spite of what that feels like at the moment. So what have you learned in the past six, seven years, whether it's writing the Boss Up series from this cold outreach they got connected with during the pandemic or from 800 plus and a million downloads they've accumulated through your podcast? What have you learned in terms of scaling up your impact and business? through the lens of mindset and personal character development. I always repeat this because I think this is so important. The biggest lesson was to ask for help, to ask for support. You don't have to do everything yourself, right? Being able to collaborate with other women, being able to, like I mentioned, being able to work with other women who have a similar purpose as you. I mean, that just 10X is everything that you want to do and scale things up to the next level. I'm not the best at everything and I'm okay with that, right? I'd rather just pay someone to do that versus me trying to figure out for 10 hours, right? That made me realize how much easier things could be if we just learn to help each other out, to seek help, to scale things, to have a team. Because, you know, in a normal business, you know, you don't do everything yourself. You hire staff, right? Uh, You hire staff to go out there to make things happen, whether it's an accountant, a lawyer, you know, if you have a restaurant, you have waiters, chefs, hostess, things like that. Being able to realize to like let go of my ego and realize I don't have to do everything myself and I'm okay with that and just seek help. That was my biggest lesson. (laughs) And that comes down to self-advocacy, which is sort of the theme you shared earlier. So how can one cultivate and get better at advocating for themselves? Because it comes down to, uh, I I just want to nerd out real quick, but it comes down to neural pathways, right? So neural pathways are the pathways you build in your brain. It's the root of all habit forming. Every single habit building comes down to neural pathways. Imagine a trail in the mountains. The more bikes and more walkers walk that same trail, it creates a more defined trail. And that is the neuropathies in our brain. 
So the more you repeat a certain action, the more that action becomes ingrained to become part of second nature. I share that because people who aren't used to advocating for themselves, women who aren't used to speaking up in the classroom, asking for a raise as you did, because that's very nerve wracking, negotiating with your boss. So I feel you. But for you, you already have these neural pathways built deeply that you can advocate for yourself. But for those who don't, what would you say? I mean, it takes practice, right? Anything we want to do in life takes practice. Nothing happens overnight. Rome wasn't built in a day. If you want 10,000 steps, it takes your first step, right? Or I forget the the yeah. line, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but yeah, it takes practice, right? I mean, I didn't get good at video by just doing that one video. I got good at video by doing it many times, right? There was one point where I did three videos a day for 30 days straight just to get my fear out right? And people are like, oh my God, you're so great at video. I'm like, well, there was a time when I was just a hot mess on video. <laughs> so everything takes practice. It doesn't matter where you, you learn a new skill, you want to run a marathon. I mean, you don't run a marathon by just going straight like 40 miles or whatever a marathon. No, I think it's like 25 miles or something like that, right? You start with maybe one kilometer, right? And then you add you know, another kilometer or maybe half a kilometer and then so on until you can do the full marathon, right? So being able to take those small actionable daily steps to yield the big results, right? If you're not ready to advocate for yourself, maybe join a group that has a similar vision or similar advocacy that you're working with, right? Maybe volunteer with them and, you know, you can learn from them to start like learning to advocate for yourself or you listen to podcasts like this or you read books or you listen to people's stories, right? There's so many different ways to do it. It's just learning to pick what works for you. So let's go a level deeper. I like to ask you to think back and bring some memories or stories forward. Could you share a few or what are some of the best success stories you've heard either on the show or within your own role models? That's not from your guests per se, but once again, it's a wide question, but I want to share some tangible, concrete, best success stories that are the outcome of advocating for yourself. Like even looking at the women in Hollywood, right? We look at like Michelle Yeoh and Sandra Oh. I mean, I love looking up to them because they're always trying to do things that's outside of their comfort zone, right? They went out there and just make things happen. And they also didn't want to be like the token Asian actress out there, right? They wanted to have different roles, right? And if they couldn't find the different roles, they decided to create something. I don't know if you've seen Everything Everywhere All at Once, right? It's a very really great movie. And it's also like, this is the first movie where an immigrant Asian woman is seen as the lead role, is seen as the heroine. And that is huge for us, right? Most of the time, the immigrant Asian woman is like the auntie you see at the Chinese grocery store, just minding her own business, getting things done and just moving along. But you don't realize all those little Asian aunties are like, you know, our own businesses, own property, have made really good investments. It's because they don't talk about it, right? Because we're taught not to talk about those things, right? So just even looking up to those women, even the guy who was also in Everything Everywhere All at Once, he was the kid from Indiana Jones and he was also in The Goonies, right? Those were his two first major roles, right? Ever in acting. And after that, like it was really hard for him to get a role in any movie because there wasn't a lot of opportunities for Asian actors. So he decided to just work behind the scenes because that's all he thought he was good for, right? And then in 2018, he saw a movie called crazy rich Asians, right? Or like, oh my God, here's, you know, these crazy rich Asians living the lavish lifestyle, something that's not typical, right? That's seen in American movies. And so he had major FOMO. He's like, I want to be part of it too. And so he revived his acting career for after more than like 20, 30 years, got casted in everything, everywhere, all at once, and now has been you know, getting more acting jobs more than ever. So when I read that story or heard him talk about it, like it just, I was crying out of happiness because it's like, this is why representation is so important, right? Because it shows other people what's possible for themselves. This guy was able to revive his acting career, right? After so many decades, right? Now we can see like, we don't always have to be the token Asian in movies or TV. We can be you know, the immigrant Asian woman, or we can be something else. We can be ourselves and play that role. Yeah, I mean, wow. His audacity and his ability to revive something after 20, 30 years, that's how long I've been alive for 30 years. So I can't even imagine something going from dormant to reactivate that and that level of fear, self-doubts, questionings, the mental fuckery, right? The chatter. I would have to ask you for that link and I'll, I'll love to read that story myself as well after. But 
And I feel like I just want to put this into context for non-minority or Asian listeners, since most of my demographics are Caucasians. Imagine, so Asian Americans are about 5.5 to 5.8% in America. The last time I checked the statistics. I thought it was like more than 6% now. Maybe it passed 6%. Yeah, but last time it was like 5.8. So let's say 5.8 to 6 point some percent. That means there is 94% of us who are Americans who don't look like us. So imagine this consistent, this dire and desire for us who are the super hyper minority in America to look for who look like us on TVs, on movies, on Hollywood, on shows. And she and I talked about this like 30 minutes ago. For the longest time in the sexual hierarchies in America, Asians men were the least desired sexual partners. They did a survey. We were below every single other race. And that's the generation I grew up with. I happened to be tall enough. I happened to be born with the certain characteristics that I was able to break out of the statistics. But for most of us, it was very difficult for Asian men to ever date outside of their realm of race. If you were an Asian man, you dated a white girl, you're a celebrity in your circles. <laughs> People are like, teach me your ways, X, Y, and Z. But that comes down to, we don't think we could do it because we've never seen it happen. It's role models. It's priming. I have a personal curiosity. Can you even imagine what your life would have been like if you didn't take your initial steps like seven years ago, 10 years ago? Because I feel like I do these mental games a lot where I would picture myself on an alternative life path by not taking the decisions I took. Of course, we'll never know because this is a thought exercise. But I just want to ask you because I feel like the version of who you are now is so different than the version of who you are. It's a drastic change. Oh, yeah. I, I would probably be a lot more miserable with my life. You know, I would like my self-esteem would be very low. You know, I would just attract the wrong things into my life. Right. I would feel like a zombie just, you know, doing what I had to do Monday to Friday, right? Just living life, but not really living life, if that makes sense. Yeah, more like just reacting through life. I think about that a lot because I, I'm a veteran myself and I went through a deployment. So I had the unique and grateful opportunity to confront death or the possibility of death. And once you see certain things in life, you now navigate life through this new added lens and you almost can't unsee it, right? That's why I think it's very fun where you just take one step and you just don't, your life will be completely different. Like seriously. In another interview you talked about, you shared how a lot of men are intimidated by confident women, right? Because especially in Asian culture, a lot of men are so patriarchal. They don't believe in therapy. They don't believe in mental health. They think this false bravado and confidence or this machoism, that's all they need. I'm the protector. I'm the provider X, Y, and Z. Can you share, however you want to take these questions, why shouldn't men be afraid of confident women who boss up? No, this is a r real question. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I know. This is like a question of like, this is all brand new. So it's like. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because like being confident as a person has so many upsides. Like you being confident benefits your partner, your, your family, your mentees, X, Y, and Z. But now because of a lot of hesitancies or this fear, that's rooted in ignorance for a lot of men. They're like, oh, I want to be in charge all the time, right? But they're missing out on so much things in life. So I know it's an interesting question, but I would love to ask you. Yeah, I mean, that's a really great question. I mean, for me, it's like if a man does support a woman who's confident, it also helps their confidence up, right? There's no ego. It's about working together. And I've seen, you know, men and women relationships where, you know, men help women in their business and it's like a beautiful relationship, right? Like there's no ego. It doesn't matter who's the breadwinner. They're doing this together, right? Because they're confident in the mission and what they're, the life that they want. So they don't care if like people make fun of them or, you know, they don't care about the outside noises in their head because they just want to help their partner become better. There are great men out there, right? Who support their women and it goes both ways, right? It's about creating win-win situations, right? They understand that if I help her out, we we live better, we help the world, we help women uh, do better, see better. Like, you know, it's just huge positive impact. That's how I see it, right? I know there's still organizations out there who say they're for women and then there's just like so much politics behind and it's just really disappointing that in 2022, we're still going through this. And so now the work is needed now more than ever to show them like there's no competition, there's no, you know, we need to let go of this like lack mindset, right? And just have the mindset of abundance, like being okay to walk side by side 
as men and women equally in leadership roles because that's how we're going to create the change, right? And people don't realize too when like most married couples, to be honest, the buying decision is most of the time the women, right? Um, (laughs) And it's true. I've asked every dude and they're like, yeah, I have no clue about my finances. My wife handles everything. So for me, it's like trying to belittle a woman is really it's not doing you any good, right? Trying to make it seem like you're the breadwinner versus like, or you have to be the person who needs to be in a hierarchy. And what's like, that's not a relationship, right? That's like a dictatorship. I mean, I don't know if I'm the person to be talking about this, to be honest, but observing about, you know, men who really have women's backs always create the best relationships and have these win-win situations. Yeah, because the best way to create a healthy ecosystem is make sure all the organisms in the ecosystem is healthy and aligned. Very, very intuitive, but a lot of people just don't understand it because ego is very blinding, right? That's what ego is. So I I know that was a funny question, but I know in (laughs) Asian culture, it's a real thing. Like a lot of Asian men are afraid of powerful women because they're like, oh no, I have to be the person in, in power. And that's not the case. I want to share something another funny I think you appreciate. I share this with a lot of my friends where I'm very ambitious. I have, I'm a clinician and a podcaster and my partner, she's a physician, right? The, uh, embracing the cultural stereotype, but she loves, she loves medicine. Like she loves it deeply. And I always tell my friends that A, she's my biggest investment portfolio is her, right? Highest ROI in six years. And B, I want to be the most ambitious trophy husband. Because I'm ambitious. I'm always going to do what I want to do. I'm always going to carry out or striving for my vision. At the same time, I don't mind if my partner's income is sixfold as mine, right? Because GI doctors make a lot of money. And I also had to work through my journey because I've always been the breadwinner. I've always had higher income, X, Y, and Zs. But then once I realized, wait, this is actually liberating because if I have a partner who is yielding insane amount of financial income as a baseline, that liberates me to do what I love while still helping her out and supporting whatever. I'm not saying I'll be stay-at-home husbands, but I'll love to be the most ambitious trophy husband. And I'm, I mean it, every single word of it. So I want to share that to reinforce this messaging. I can see it in like, you know, I was looking through your Instagram and you're like, you know, you're like her number one cheerleader and I love it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, she's very humble and I have a lot of a prone proclivity for hubris. So I'm trying to help promote her by help grounding me. but. She makes it better as a person. And yeah, before I conclude the interview with a couple signature questions, another personal curiosity is you've been doing podcasting for seven years. That is a formidable amount of time. Like A, why do you keep going? And B, what have you taken away the most from your podcast journey so far? I'm very passionate about creating a better representation. You know, there wasn't a lot of stories out there for Asian women, like specifically for Asian women, or even a support system that even catered to Asian women's confidence. It was the main reason why I started the podcast. You know, I was dealing with my own confidence issues and I just couldn't find any support systems that really catered to Asian women. And I was like, what is going on? Like, is there something wrong with me? right? Nobody's talking about this. And also representation was very important for me, especially, you know, growing up in one of the most multicultural cities in the world, I never saw anybody that looked like me on TV. You know, all I ever saw was Caucasian people. And for the longest time, I wanted to be a blonde haired blue eyed girl named Heather, because that's what I thought being beautiful was at the time. And so for me, I never wanted, you know, current and future generations to go through what I went through. And so that's what keeps me going. It's the purpose. It's the bigger picture. It's not easy, of course, right? Even when I first started podcasting, there was and a lot of Asian podcasters out there, right? There was only like one guy who was interviewing our community. And I said, okay, if he's doing it, then I'm going to do it. You know, if it wasn't for him, I don't think I'd be here today. And I was so fortunate that I was able to be interviewed on his podcast. Like it was a huge honor for me because I was like, you know, it was because of you, I started this podcast. You know, I just saw that you were doing it. And I was like, okay, I see one Asian dude doing it. I'm going to go ahead and do it. And that, you know, I was forever grateful to him because he's the most you know, he's the nicest guy in the world, very humble, very, you know, passionate about elevating the Asian community as, as well, right? And so just like being able, when he approached me, I was just like over the moon <laughs> because I was like, 
I looked up to this guy, right, at the time when there was no podcasters back then. And podcasts really taught me to show up as my true self, like telling you about loving yourself, like really loving yourself, the good, bad, and the ugly. That's not easy to do, right? I mean, as women, we're like, we always criticize our worst things, right? It's like, oh, I can't wear this dress because my rolls are showing. Oh, I got a pimple on my face. I need to hide from the world. Like just these little things, right? Oh my God, I just said something on TV and, you know, I sound so stupid or whatever it is, right? We're our own worst critics. But when we can learn to love all aspects of ourselves, we can learn to show up as our true selves. We can show up as our authentic selves and also learning to build boundaries, right? Because in our culture, we're not taught to build boundaries. We always have to say yes to every single thing. And sometimes we end up saying yes to the wrong things or we end up in situations we can't get out of. So we have to learn to say no to the things that don't help us, right? That's toxic because that helps us in the end. So those are some of the things that I've learned. And just knowing that I wasn't the only one feeling this way, right? Not feeling good enough, second guessing myself, you know, having fear paralyze me for the longest time, feeling lost, like being able to interview these women and sharing their stories, realize like, oh my God, like they were like me, right? They were just like me. And if they're able to overcome it, then so can I. It's just, for me, representation is showing you what's possible, right? And even more so when we have people in our community, right, that look like us, that went through similar situations, that understand our cultural backgrounds and cultural upbringing and the standards we go through. Yeah, I mean, I could imagine the level of ecstaticness you felt when you're invited to this podcast that inspire your podcast to begin with, literally the birth of your podcast, so to speak. I said I would wrap this interview soon, but I have another follow-up personal curiosity questions, you know? I talk about this a lot with a lot of guests and almost every guest on my show, because I, I seek out individuals who have taken the non-traditional path, who have intentionally chosen a path of the highest resistance. Because I feel like the I'm a veteran, right? It's a military analogy, but in the military, when you're going to a hostile environment, they always teach you to seek out the path of least resistance because you don't want to run into a rains of fire, so to speak. But in life, I think most of us should be encouraged and try to seek out the highest resistance path because there lies the most growth. So you included all those guys who chosen those paths. There's many moments in their lives that's affirmative by cosmos, by God, by universe, whatever you want to call it. And when you're on a certain path, I think the world and universe tells you that, hey, Sheena, you're on the right path. Here's an affirmation during your toughest, lowest moments. Keep going. I sense that from your story. So could you share anything else that comes up in terms of when the cosmic affirms you when you're least certain and least confident, but they're like, nope, you're on the right path. Keep going. Yeah. I mean, you know, it can be something as simple as like, a listener sending me a message telling me how the podcast has helped them. That for me is like, okay, that's a sign that I need to keep moving forward. Because yeah, of course, there's days where I wanted to quit and felt like, is what I'm doing even worth it? Like, are people even listening? Do they even care? Right. And so especially when you're on your own path, and you're trying to elevate a community, sometimes you got to do things by yourself, right? Because not everybody sees it, not everybody gets it. Or in reality, people are just cheering for you in silence, right? They're like, they're rooting for you, but they're not telling you that they're rooting for you. Um, and so yeah, there'd be like these just these moments, right? It's maybe reading like, a message or like horoscopes or something that I'm really big into. Like I'll read my horoscope and I'll be like, oh, wow, that makes a lot of sense. And I don't read every single horoscope. It's just like one or two sources that I go to that really makes sense for me that just like kind of gets me. And it's kind of weird sometimes, right? And so being able to do that and just I like, get a message and it's like, oh, this is like just popping up out of nowhere, right? Sometimes it's when you least expect it. Or maybe someone says something to me and I didn't even think about it. And it's like, oh yeah, right? There's just all these little moments, even if it's just watching like a K-drama, <laughs> you know, I still, I still get something out of that. So it's just like these little things that kind of like seed you into your journey. That's how for me it was, yeah. And being able to connect with the right people who understand what I go through. Yeah, I interviewed a astrologist and tarot reader. So I, I learned a lot about the esoteric nature of astrologians and horoscope signs. It's actually a pretty cool episode. But I asked that questions because that's how I wanted to end the interview with because we started the conversation with fear. Like what does fear mean to you and what's your approach to fear and how has that approach and perception shifted over the years? But these affirmative moments by the cosmos and by cosmic, you won't experience this affirmations without taking and tackling your fear face on period 
And this is ubiquitous across all my interviews. And I'm sure it's ubiquitous across all your 800 plus episodes, right? And if you don't take away anything from this, just take away that in with both of our collective experiences, the world will create space for passionate people. If you're willing to venture into the unknown and willing to seek out what's possible, you don't have to follow through it, but at least have the initiative or the intention. And you'll be surprised by how the world opens up for you. Like, I cannot emphasize this enough because I, I believe in it. I felt these visceral moments and so have you. With that being said, before I hit you with the closing questions and to roll out the red carpet for you, you're also dressing red today, so very thematic. The question is the uh, discover more question. And then I want to ask you for some parting message for the listeners, if any. So the question is twofold, Sheena. The fold one is what is an area in your life, whether it's your community advocacy work or just your personal life that you want to discover more about after these nuanced and encompassing conversations? Second fold is what is an area in our listeners' life that you want to encourage or even to challenge to discover more about after this episode with you? Yeah. And also I wear red because red's my confidence color. So if anybody ever sees me, I'm always in red. <laughs> and also in Chinese culture, it's a happy color, right? So I just wanted to point that out. For me, it's just always learning to overcome my own fears. I mean, you know, just because I overcome one fear doesn't mean it's I'm good. Like there's always new fears that comes up. There's always things that I still resist, right? And I'm just being honest because sometimes they see you on social media and they think, oh my God, she's so confident. Oh my God, she's got it all together. Half the time, to be honest, I don't. <laughs> you know, sometimes I figure things out along the way. You know, if I have to do something on the spot, it's just like, you know, that has helped me learn to build confidence, learning to just do things on the spot. So I'm still learning to overcome fear, still, you know, learning to like reach out to the people that I still want to. There's still certain people I'd love to reach out that I'm still resisting, right? And that's normal, right? Because we're human, we're not robots, we're not perfect. And, you know, we're always growing, right? Growing to the next level. For the listeners, also it's just to learn to make that first move. Don't be afraid, you know, whether it's starting a new business, reaching out to someone, don't be afraid to make the first move. If you get rejected, it's okay, right? At least you did it versus wondering what if. Yeah. What if turns into lingering regrets that you'll be thinking about when you're 85 years old in your bed and you're like, ah, I remember that one day 40 years ago. It's real. Like regrets do linger forever. I still remember that one girl I was afraid to ask out freshman in high school, which was like 20 years ago. I will never know because I never asked because I was like, oh, she's out of my league, X, Y, and Z. Self-talk or negative self-talk is always present. But Hopefully with this, people can live with one less regret in their life because I think regret is something we can 100% control nine out of 10 times. So with that, this is where I roll out the red carpet for you, red carpet for you, the happy color of Chinese culture, Tishina. Where can people connect more with you about? Where can the woman listeners in my demographics and community of Discover more to learn more about other ways to approach confidence building, other ways to maybe learn about how to scale up their impact? how to be this version they aspire to be and finally can become this person that you have become through years of evolutions and decision making. Yeah, for sure. So they can check out my website, shinayapchan.com. They can purchase a copy of the book, Asian Women Who Boss Up. They can also check out the podcast, The Tao of Self-Confidence on Apple, Spotify, Google Play, or the website, thetowofselfconfidence.com. I'm the only Sheena Yapchan in the world. So even if you look it up, you'll see all my social media out there, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, even TikTok, but I don't do dances. So um, <laughs> they can check out all my social media and see all the posts that I do, whether it's, you know, women empowerment, advocacy, women leadership, or just even sharing a photo of my nephew. <laughs> nice. I I've seen your nephew's picture. Uh, a cute baby. <laughs> cute baby. For Thank sure. you. <laughs> um, yeah, as always, I will include all the episode information and links below for the listeners to check it out. I really subscribe to the same mythos that Sheena believes where confidence or self-confidence and this ability to trust in our ability to execute whatever we want to see to execute is one of the most undervalued lifelong skill sets because that confidence spills over to all aspects of your life. That's why I asked you, why shouldn't guys be afraid of powerful women who boss up? Because confidence it's inspiring for everyone. And there's so much upside and hopefully more people can follow that confidence path, right? And I hate to do this every episode, but the most recent YouTube analytics shows that 65 to 70% of the viewers are not subscribed. YouTube has been doing really well with only being six weeks out there. So if you can hit a subscribe, like, and share, it really motivates me to 
keep this as pure and unmonetized as I possibly could because I want to do this by providing free maximum volume with no hidden strings attached. And with that, if you're listening to on the audio platform, the YouTube goes live on Sundays and episodes always goes live on Mondays. And I will link all the information and, you know, truly I appreciate Sheena's time today. And for all the listeners to who have chosen to discover more this week and hope to always see you again on the next week's of Train Up Discover More. And as always, thank you for listening.